The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. How many of you have that question? In Genesis 6, when it says it was Nephilim before the flood and also after that, how are we dealing with them today? Are we dealing with them today? And then the big question is, some of you, no doubt, through the course of your studies, you're saying, well, is our society really that different from past societies? Is there such thing called freedom or not? We're going to answer some of those today. Many people think there is a thing called freedom, but this is what the Lord was conveying to all of his people. The Lord said you were in bondage, didn't he? Didn't he say you were in bondage? He said you were in the world of darkness, chained up in bondage, in death. You're not free if you're in the world. You're jailed in a prison if you're of the world. Now, to be free of the world, how do you do that? Because you can't, it's not like you can leave this earth and go to a different planet. How do you become free? In your mind and spirit. And your soul becomes free. So what is truly bound? Your mind is. Your mind is that choice center. Your mind is like a book with lots of information in it. Your, things do enter into the heart which eventually turn into actions. You're bound because there's both darkness and light in your mind. And that began in the garden. When Eve partook of the fruit, when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, by the way, fruit means yield. When they partook of the fruit, they knew both darkness and light. And the Lord said, lest they take the tree of life and then they live forever. So we got to go ahead and let's boot them out of Eden. So then good and evil is in your mind, light and dark is in your mind. And when you're in the world, you know nothing. You, do, you don't know anything about the true light. And it takes the power of Jesus Christ to actually break you from that darkness because you begin to realize, it, which is why you become so sad in a lot of cases. When you learn about Christ, you become sad about the world. Do you know why? You become sad for two reasons. One, because you were a part of it. And in a lot of cases, you hate to leave it. You become frustrated. Because you were used to the world, you're not used to the things of Christ. Because you're used to operating by seeing, not by faith. You're not used to operating by faith. So sometimes it's very difficult to operate by faith versus something you can see. But I give you a warning. Because the Lord said you have the power through His power to overcome that when you get ready. I encourage everybody to do so. Maybe we can clarify some of that. Because if it's one thing I, I, I don't like is this. Now, I'll say it again, a lot of people, I used to hear a lot of ministers when I was young, they'd say, well, you know, they tell people you need to get saved. So I'm thinking to myself when I was young, well, how do you get saved? You know, they tried to explain, they said, well, you just come to the altar and give your life to Christ. I said, well, surely that doesn't save people. But, I mean, this was in my mind. I said, look at them, they're still in bondage. They were in bondage, they were still like that. They would give their lives to Christ and, and they would still be kind of miserable. I said, that's not freedom. How can they be free when they're miserable? That's impossible. They're not free. And when you know it, as you, as you grow and read the Word of God, you find out that's precisely true. And so there was a missing gap in people's lives. They obtained the knowledge over many years of their lives, but they were never able to be free. And then you often wonder why. And where did this stem from? Well, it began in the garden, and then it was somewhat subdued just a little bit. Came back again with the fallen angels. Now we live in a system of them. Because you see leaders in the world, and sometimes it looks like they can work together and work apart. I mean, they, they talk too much together. They don't mingle with the people. Who are these folks anyway? Right? They do not mingle with the people, do they? So they're not your average, ordinary person. But they all know each other. But they have their internal quarrels and things of that nature. Nevertheless, they're not ordinary people. So you got to ask yourself about that too. And, and we're going to in, in, introduce terms like Elohim. You're going to hear that term, son of God. You're going to understand the word Nephilim. You'll begin to understand what you're in the middle of that you never saw before. Some of you may begin to go, you might go jump in a shower and say, Oh Lord, wash me, wash me quickly. It's good to understand the context of these things, okay? So we're going to go back from the fallen angels. First, did their little thing. Remember, when they were, um, this is chapter 6. If you're there, let me give you a link to this, guys. Now listen, I'm using this link, but I don't encourage everybody to read all the books on this website. Always be responsible when you're dealing with uh, online material, okay? You have the Holy Spirit, which is your validation source, all right? Don't start jumping. Please don't jump to a bunch of books thinking that you found a website with a bunch of information. You're going to read everything on the website. Don't do that. Be led to read by the Spirit of what you read so that it can be useful. 
we don't have to waste our time anymore on dead subjects because we have the Holy Spirit that will guide us into everything we need to know. All right? The Holy Spirit will guide us. Now, the Father always does this. If you have the ability to utilize something, he does require that of us. Whatever we do not have the ability to do or to acquire, well, then that's when he steps in. But whatever he gives us, whatever he empowers us to do, he requires that of us. Okay? Whatever we don't have power to do, and if we need it, then he provides for us. All right? That's the way it works. So what I'm telling you is there are lots of resources online, but has the Lord led you to those things? Don't read something he has not led you to. Never read something out of curiosity. Please save yourself some trouble. Don't read things out of curiosity. It will tie up years of your life, make you spiral into doubt and everything else, and your world's going to turn dark again. This is about actual liberty, actually having the Spirit of the Lord upon your life 24 hours a day, not just a couple of hours a day, not just a few minutes a day, but to have the Spirit of the Lord upon your life 24 hours a day. And I find it interesting that it was written where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, well, guess what? When the Holy Spirit is upon your life, too, there is also liberty. And that's something. What is the Spirit of the Lord? Is that not the mind of the Lord? That's why it was said we have to have the mind of Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is when you begin, the Spirit combines attributes, properties, unctions, the way, the principles, everything else of the Lord. So if his spirit is upon you, you begin to do those things Jesus did, and there is no bondage at all. There's absolute freedom. You can tell when you're outside of bondage because you impose no bondage on another. In other words, you don't task another. You compliment the good of where they are, and if they allow you to, you give instruction. That's called freedom. It's never forced. You're not forced to have salvation. Everything should be voluntary. That's just like church. No one should ever force anybody to go to church. That's not true worship. Voluntary. When you decide to go to church out of love, then it is received. And then it works. But if you're forced, that's called an obligation. You are under no obligation. You're a citizen of the kingdom. And if you love the Lord, your father, if you love Jesus of Nazareth, you will do all things through love. See, if you, do all, if you do all things through love, you can't be disobedient. Not doing all things through man's love, through God's love. You can't be disobedient because you're doing all things in love. And that means when you do something in love because it's not an obligation, you will do it and walk away. And it doesn't matter if the person receives it or not because you did so in love. You did it from the heart. It doesn't matter if they receive it. So even worship is out of love not out of obligation. When the uh, Ten Commandments and the Statutes, Commandments, and Judgments, those were obligations they had to keep. But guess what happened? It turned over into love. And when Jesus came, all those acts that he required of us were acts of love. Everything he spoke was an act of love. Did you notice he didn't use that word obedience too much? Do you know why? Because love supersedes that term. It also supersedes disobedience. Those who walk in love, they also walk in truth. Those who walk in love and truth and the light, guess what they do? They walk in a perfected way. You come to find out that perfected way is the walk of love. You know, when Jesus said, if somebody smacks you on the left cheek, turn to him to right also, that's called love. If somebody abuses you one way and you don't do anything, and you offer the other side for abuse too, you know what that does? It kills the power of evil, and most of you don't know that. Running will never stop the power of evil. It doesn't. It makes evil chase. But when you give of yourself in love, evil cannot perform. How many of you know that? It's so funny, too. Just like many cannot equate the word love to many things in their life, nor can they fully comprehend evil. Evil is the opposite of love. But where love is, love begins to take over evil. It's like a virus that spreads within seconds. No evil man on earth today can overpower love itself. But very seldom is love ever executed out of the heart in this world. That's very rare. It's very seldom that happens. And that's what Jesus taught us, because in that is obedience. Outside of love is a bunch of information that the fallen have perpetuated. So I'm going to go back to chapter 6 and read this to you again. Because if you think it ended back then, it didn't. I'm going to just do a recap. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied in those days that were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. This is when societies began to multiply in the earth. And the angels 
comma, the children of heaven saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives among the children of men that began as children. So what happened was these folks who were, by the way, that term watchers, the term watchers is actually called the shining ones who watch. That, that's the Hebrew term. I'm going to give you the English term, but the Hebrew term is the shining ones who watch. Watchers. The shining ones. So they were appointed to intercede for man, to watch over certain things of man. That's why all of them had assignments. You know, Uriel, Raphael, all of them, all the way down to the others who fell. Now they were direct creations of God to sons of children of God, children of the creator of God, right? Children of the creator made eternal, not made like mankind. And also in Hebrew, their names also are Elohims. You know, the beginning of Genesis, it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man has become like us, gods, plural. Well, they put gods in there, that plural term to signify the Elohims, the Elohims. Listen to me. When God gives a command, who carries out the command? Angels, you must pick this up. Who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Messengers have these powers to execute the commands of God himself. God is spirit. So when he gives a command to his, his, his uh, uh, direct creations, they were created to execute his commands. They were. Why would he create them in the first place if he were going to do everything himself? No. Everything is purpose, ladies and gentlemen, even you. I hope you can get this because you're purposed. And you may be sitting idle. That may be the source of your torment because you're not doing what you were created to do. You were created for a purpose. And just like we read about the other day, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, its, its strength, it's good for nothing to be thrown out, okay? So these guys chose wives from among the children of men and begat, they wanted to uh, get children. So they made an oath on Mount Hermon. And what it was, was uh, um, uh, Simyaza, who was a leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered to him and said, let us swear an oath. Now he was telling them, hey, I'm going to take responsibility for everything that happens. That's what he said. Simyaza did. Consequently, Simyaza is the same one that's been in time for a long time. He was a leader of them. Now you, now you know a name of something that's been here from the beginning. Simyaza. So they all come down to earth. They mate with women. And what happens? What happens? You know, when you go into the book of Jasher, and it's very difficult. Can you imagine yourself trying to explain something you really can't explain? Having to document something you can't, you can hardly document. And you know how we have terms and slang words and things of that nature. So they attempted to precisely translate these words. And it's only because, see, a lot of times when you translate, if you don't do it verbatim, you'll minimize what actually happened. But when you go back to the Hebrew, you can see the truth. Now we can. They couldn't see that a while back because they didn't have the language skills that we have today, to be honest with you. See, because English was an evolving language. How many of you know that? Now that we have a definitive lexicon, we can build upon some of the ancient things and actually figure it out. So knowledge has certainly increased. And when it comes to deciphering things, most people are a little better than that than they realize. Because you can decipher. Consequently, you have the spirit too. So it seems like all these things, all these books and things were unlocked. Only with us though. Because this book has been around since, what, for a long time. Nobody could really understand it. Now it makes perfect sense. So anyway, these guys, they made a pact on Mount Hermon, and they took to themselves wives, is what they did. And why did they do that? Did they love the women? Nope. How many of you know that? They lusted after them. They didn't love the women. Not at all. They wanted to perpetuate their own children. And Genesis 6 says what? What does it say in Genesis 6, you guys? Do you guys know what it says? And the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives, which all they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now listen, two types. Now see, everybody's looking for the giants, but they're forgetting about the men of renown. 
What is a man of renown? That will be an individual whose reputation precedes them. We have those today. That means they were good looking. That's why they lost it after them. Whenever it says fair, that means they look pretty good. Fair, beautiful, like a fair maiden. You know, the old English, same thing. So these guys, full of lust, went down and got themselves wives, and they bear children. So they all took wives, and they began to defile themselves with women. And they taught them charms, enchantments, and cutting of roots, and made acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and bare giants whose height was 3,000 owls, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began, they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and to drink blood. And then the earth laid accusation against lawlessness. Interesting fact is this. When you go back into archaeology to the very, I mean, the ancient, ancient of histories, you see evidence you just simply can't deny. You see axes that are 20 foot tall. I think they have collected a total of 1,800 axes that are about 20 foot tall. And there are a few of those in museums. A lot of them are in the Smithsonian in the basement. Now, who in the world could ever pick up an axe 20 feet tall? Who can do that? That's too big. So, you know, something big was wielding this thing. They have found huge sandals. Who's going to wear some huge sandals? I'm talking about huge sandals. Earrings that are ginormous. You know, things of that nature. And who in the world? You, you, you have to ask yourself, so what happened? And, and, and then you see these large megalithic stones that date back. And then as time went forward, the stones got smaller and smaller. So what truly happened on the face of this earth? Then you find these libraries with men and dinosaurs. See what we have here. You know what? This is why I like the book of Enoch. Because men pride themselves on knowledge. And when they think they know something, and when you tell them they don't know it, their whole world is shaken up. When you prove the opposite of what a person knows, their whole world is shaken up. Why? Because they built their own foundation. Listen, if your foundation is upon Jesus Christ, there's nothing in this world that will shake you up. Nothing. If a strange something start walking across the face of the earth, it still wouldn't shake you up. Why? Because that, that has nothing to do with your foundation. Your foundation is in the absolute truth, which is Jesus Christ. But many people don't know what they're dealing with right now. You see, people are full of offense. In the end days, wickedness and iniquity will rise. Why? Why? It's just the love of many is going to wax colder and colder because iniquity will abound. But where did this iniquity come from? Why are they being inspired to change all the laws to suit the same abominations that had Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Why? Because mankind has a pattern. Let me give you an example of their patterns. You face spiritual controversies. You hear things, and you're engaged in things, but what it does is it causes you to understand the Word of God, doesn't it? It gives you something of an understanding when you see anybody go against the Word of God. You don't call them out on what they did, but you begin to understand, hey, that's what's going on here. So then those in the world are an intricate part of the process of you comprehending the Word of God. You learn the, you learn the most things in the Word of God through times of opposition. How many of you know that? Do they not trigger you to really take in the truth? When you are opposed at something, you cling to the word even more. You'll do two things, cling to the word or fall apart in your own life. And then because you belong to the Lord, you'll eventually see it anyway. But they demonstrate the word of God to you. We read about the good stuff, but we don't believe the evil stuff. Isn't that funny? We do. We want to believe all the good stuff, not the evil. The evil stuff we call darkness, we don't want to see it. Right? The good stuff we call pleasing, we want all of that. But it's not in balance. The good should be normal, and the darkness should be abnormal. We still see it as good and evil. I see it as normal and abnormal. Love is normal. Hatred is abnormal. I thought we are citizens of the kingdom. If you're a citizen, shouldn't the ways of that kingdom be normal life to you? Shouldn't the supernatural be natural to you? Supernatural just means above the natural. So shouldn't the supernatural be common normal to you. It should be expected. You shouldn't have to try and believe it. It should be a part of your life. Because the truth is, God has done something supernatural in all of your lives already. So anyway, these guys come, they have children. They teach humankind all these weird things. And then the earth could not sustain them. By the way, that term serpent came up at the same time during this time. When I first read the book of Enoch, and I've looked at the history of this entire world, seeing things that very few people have seen. 
people, you know, it's just a line of things that I was in, being told many things, okay? But I'm telling you now, the New Testament, it all makes sense in the New. Jesus put it all together so perfectly. Nobody could ever do that. When you understand the past, when you've seen the evidence, when you see those of power just shocked and in awe, astounded, when you see crystal writings, listen to me close. You guys are going to think I lost it. What would you do if you saw a crystal block with words in the block that are moving? What would you do? The words in the block are pure gold. The crystal is a solid crystal. How in the world are the letters moving around and swish washing on the inside? It's not full of liquid. It's all solid. Hmm? What do you think that is? To you, it would be sci-fi. But if you saw it, it would destroy your world. That small thing would destroy your world. You see, mankind walks around prideful, discounting stores. They're facing it now and they don't see it. This is why many men are going to be doomed. Because the truth is, the men of renown are back in the world again. The kingdoms of this earth have never changed. The kingdoms of this earth are the same as they've been there, and people think they're free. But most of the knowledge that you have is knowledge of the kingdoms of this world. You don't have all the knowledge of the kingdom of God, or no one would be offended. People are only offended when they don't know themselves. But when you know that you know that you know, you can never be offended. If I told Angela, Angela, I don't believe you're white. I think you're African. Angela would say, okay. Now, if Angela was African-American, she put some white shoe polish on her face. She was trying to hide her face. And did a pretty good job. And I said, I think you're African-American. She might get offended and say, why? Why would you say that? Right? She might get offended. Why? Why? Because she doesn't really know herself. She's trying to be something else. So therefore, she's lost her identity. Identity crisis. And then we get offended. A person who does not have an identity crisis will never be offended. You guys see how that works? Let me tell you what an offense is. You ready for this? An offense is this. An offense is when, like I hear ministers out there and they almost quote something. Do you know people get mad at the misquote? Why would you get mad at somebody misquoting scripture? If you're part of the kingdom. If I'm sitting at home and somebody on television misquotes a scripture, I'm not going to get mad. I can discern if it were a mistake or not. I can discern if it were on purpose or not. I'm not going to be fooled by that. You know why? Because I know where I stand. I know what I believe. I'll never get mad. If somebody misquotes something or believes a different way, I will pray for that person and say, Lord, please, show them like you showed me. Be merciful to them. They don't, because you have discernment. You even know when they're straying away, slipping away, doing things for reasons. You begin to pray for them. You're not offended. All that's left in the time of the giants, and it's back again. That's why the earth was consumed, because of the ways of the fallen were spread around the globe. After they taught men all these things, these giants and men of renown in the earth consume the acquisitions of men. Nothing could support them. Nothing could support their appetites. So listen, then it says, because they devoured mankind, it said, and they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish. Well, wait a minute. You mean to tell me, now it's very important you understand this, because folks, please stick with me and understand this. It says here in the book of Enoch, they consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men can no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish. What do you mean? They devoured mankind. They took up all the acquisitions of men. And then it goes immediately and they began to sin against birds. So it's telling you how they devoured man. Sin devoured mankind. That's why in the book of Genesis, listen to me. Come on, folks. Stay with me. It is the sin when they consumed all the acquisitions of men and when men can lo no longer sustain them. The giants turned against them and devoured mankind. How did they devour them? All those corrupt ways they taught me earth. Sin. What is sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. Did they not teach mankind all these abominable things? Yes. Did they not have mankind in servitude to many things? Yes. You know what people used to call them? It seems like every country that was had one of these fallen angels over them. That's why many people worship these little gods. But that word God was never meant to be used as God, but a shining one, an elf. An elf, they used to call the tall children of the fallen, the big ones. Elf means uh, one of the giant fallen ones. But that word L means shining. The word L itself means shining. Guess what? That word is distributed across the entire face of the earth. The entire earth with the different languages spoke of the same things. 
And then when men could no longer sustain them, they turned against them and devoured mankind. And then they began to sin against birds. How did they sin against birds, bees, and reptiles, and fish? Mixing DNA. You got to understand that they were geniuses. What are most of the geniuses in our modern time? What do they do to the world? What, what's notable to them? What was the application of their knowledge, the totality of their knowledge? What did it do? I'll tell you what it did. It allowed us to create nuclear weapons. It allowed us to create technology to spy on the enemy. You, you see, the great geniuses of our world have done nothing more than perfect weaponry and a control system. That's what it did. And all of the geniuses in our time and times before, they got all their knowledge from a different realm. What's that one, guys? Uh, Aristocrates and, and uh, Atom and uh, some other folks. Because a long time ago, even in the Roman Empire was existing, do you guys know they already described the atom? Now, tell me this. How come they already described the atom and the electrons and protons back then? But that's supposed to be a new discovery, right? No, they got that from another realm. The guy who discovered atoms said he received that information in meditation. Nikola Tesla said he was talking to people from Mars, and they gave him formulas and everything else in his head. Einstein said that he would meditate and communicate with a power greater than himself. You guys, you see where I'm going with this? They all receive their information from somewhere else. Bill Gates said the same thing. Steve Jobs, same thing. And all of them know about the Akashic Records from Einstein all the way to Bill Gates. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? There are no Akashic Records. What they're dealing with are the fallen, the deceivers, man, fallen angels. And because they're dealing with fallen angels, the one third was cast out with Lucifer, but only 200 fell on Mount Hermon. That leaves a whole bunch more left. They're still dealing with what? The shining ones, the elves, sons of God, Elohim, messengers, uh, children of God, direct children of the shine of the Lord of Spirits is, is what they are. It's, just, it's all one the same. You have bad ones, you have good ones. These things are inherent liars because they have an agenda. See, that's why that's what makes Jesus so important because when he came, he said, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, it's very important everybody know this. He said, I am no other way. You're not going to read the Old Testament alone and be saved. No, nope, won't do it. You can keep everything in there, you're doomed. Jesus specifically said when he came, I am the way. Why did he say that? Because he knew we receive the word directly, absent the interpretation of mankind, the simple truth of Christ. And it is so simple. It is not complicated. You see, the fallen, make they make it complicated because they deal in a control system, just like they do today. Let me tell you something. Is not, it is, isn't mankind devouring mankind? Let me tell you what they've done. All the inventions of man are not serving everybody on the face of this earth, though it could. But what it's really doing is devouring mankind. Every day, thousands of people die. Tens of thousands die every single day through weapons, through evil devices, all the time, every single day. When, they can, when mankind can no longer sustain them, because what were they doing? See, what you don't know is what they train people. They train people how to utilize the demon spirits in the earth, the ones who were locked away inside the earth. You didn't know that, did you? Guess what they call them? The serpents. That's where they dwell. The serpents, the same ones, the same serpents from which the Hebrew word Cain comes from. You didn't know that either, did you? That has to deal with serpents also. That's why the serpent, the serpent in the garden, was he was... The serpent is a designation. How many of you know that? There are two words that were used in the garden. One is a ser serpent after he was cursed, and it's a different name before he was cursed. And that something. Two different words in the Hebrew. It is not the same word. Boy, how they just corrupt everything. Because they don't want people to understand that right now, what you really enjoy is what the serpents and the fallen have given you. That's what you enjoy which fights against the Word of God. You know what? Sometimes when you're, when you're going through a subject, I, I know people want to get to the interesting parts and stuff like that, right? But see, if you don't have a basis of the truth, you'll never see the truth. You, you just won't see the truth. And many people will not read the Book of Enoch, but they have not laid eyes on any of the original scrolls either, nor have they seen the pact sent the disciples carried around the same Book of Enoch in there. They knew the Book of Enoch, the disciples did. Isn't that something? They carried around these satchels with the Book of Enoch in them, with, their, with the, uh, sc uh, they had the uh, scrolls of Enoch in them. They were intricate to everybody back there. And then they took it all away, 
See, the, when the book was, when the Bible was canonized, that, that they didn't add in the book of Enoch because the book of Enoch was already with it. They didn't want that in there. They said, we got to decide what we're going to put in there and give out to everybody. Isn't that something? Yes, it was, Captain Mark. It sure was. It was part of that. It's, it's just amazing because if you think that um, people weren't noticing what the apostles were doing, oh, yes, they were. And they would often refer to the book of Enoch. They would often talk about how the book of Enoch spoke of Christ. And they were so excited back in those days, and they used to encourage each other, that this was what the book of Enoch was talking about, Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? But they didn't want that in there. Didn't want that in there. You know why? Because it covers the giants. You know why? Because it covers the fallen angels. Do you know why? It's because it covers some truth, right? And it, it does not give room for sin. See, haven't you noticed that a lot of people read the New Testament and they will tell you, oh, it's okay if you have a sinful life. You'll eventually not have it. Are you? No. That's the problem. People are okay with sin. Jesus says, no, don't do that. He clearly said the wages of sin is death. He clearly told people to go and sin no more. But that's not what they're teaching these days. They're saying, hey, you can sin and God will eventually forgive you. That is blasphemous, going against what Jesus taught. Never once did Jesus ever say that. He said, depart from sin. Run from it. And if your eye causes you to sin, to pluck it out. That's pretty violent, isn't it? If anything on your body, any member, anything attached to you or anything in your home causes you to sin, throw it out. Now, to pluck your eyeball out, it, it, that's pretty harsh. Because the end result of sin, there's no coming back from. But that's not what they're teaching. And guess what the book of Enoch does? It emphasizes that very thing. Because the fallen came in and they established kingdoms. The Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Egyptians, all of that, the fallen ones, the Agigis, they were roaming around all these different places and all these different type names. Yes, there's a backstory. And we can't, we're not going into all that, but we're certainly going to name the components. And then you have the Illuminati. If people knew what the Illuminati was, first of all, you have L, which means the shining ones, and the Illuminati is a public name that was given. You even have, you know, the, just the names they give stuff. Is, is wrong like Vatican, like America itself. That name, America, Vatican, England, that word. I, you just read, you go back and you do the history of this word and you say, oh my Lord, what kind of a world am I living in? And the one they hate is Israel. Oh, they hate that word. And all these folks, and there are some folks out there. How in the world, listen to me, how in the world can you read the gospel of Jesus Christ that's absolutely about freedom of your soul? and be bound up in anger and offenses and all this other stuff. Let me ask you, what power is that? Jesus came to set the captive free, so then why are people still in bondage? Having the word of Jesus Christ. That should not be possible, and I'll tell you why it's happening. Because they heard the words of Christ, and the deceiver has told them something else. The deceiver told them, it's okay for you to keep your sin. That's what the deceiver said. Now, that's what the fallen angels did. When they began to consume all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them because they required sacrifices, they required this strange things they required, just like our society is built upon today, you are actually raised to serve a kingdom, period. You were raised to be a citizen of the kingdom. You were raised to be a citizen, not of God's kingdom, but these world's kingdoms. And if you can't be an active member in the kingdoms, you're going to die. It's the same thing. Now do you guys understand? These kingdoms teach you how to keep these kingdoms going. So whoever is raised up, they're going to keep the way of the established kingdoms. They do not belong to God. That is a lie from the pit of hell itself. If they belonged to God, then it is God of which men would give the glory. They don't belong to God. And I'll tell you something. Any nation that proclaimed his name in the beginning and fell away, there are people going to bondage, and I'm telling you, we're in bondage. You think you have freedom? You do not. Because many Christians are still serving the world. They still have fun in the world. They compensate for fun. They say, hey, it's okay to have fun. They don't want to read the Word of God because, listen, once you read the words of Christ, you don't want to have fun. You want to be free. Once you desire to be free, that means you recognize your bondage. 
Because if you can't recognize your bondage, you'll never be free. Because you'll never think you're bound. And if you don't think you're bound, your spiritual eyes are shut. You're walking around blind. You can't see anything. You too will say, oh, this sin is okay. Oh, well, that's just the way they are. You got to give them time. No, listen, when an ambulance comes and somebody's in the road bleeding out, they don't say, oh, well, just, you know, it's just a little blood right there. No big deal. Let's look at this video before we get over there. That's not what you do. When an ambulance comes and looking for the injured, they rush to the injured. They get the injured. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. The word of God, the words of Jesus, is the care that we, the ambulances, give to the world. You're not supposed to say, oh yeah, this sin is okay and this. No, because that's what's killing people. So when you come up near a person who's about to die, you need to administer first aid. You know what the first aid is? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can't make the wound worse by giving your own interpretation. You have to have the spirit of the living God. You have to have the Holy Spirit or your help can become disastrous. People are no longer concrete. They're no longer concrete concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're just passive in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many people ask, well, where in the world the miracles? They still go on, but they only go on, right? Those miracles go on where the word of God is for real. It will not ever be in a place where any sin is compensated for, where people just say, oh, it's okay. Let me, let me give you an example of something. You ready for this? Jesus says, no man has promised tomorrow, didn't he? Wasn't it also written, choose ye this day whom ye will serve? So you're not promised tomorrow. Jesus said that. In the Old Testament, it says, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Then why in the world do people walk around saying, I have time? That's a lie from the pit of hell. If Jesus said you're not promised tomorrow, then everything he told you, you've got to execute today, not tomorrow. He didn't promise you tomorrow. So therefore, you can't put anything off for tomorrow. You have to do it today. So if you know of something of the word of God, stop telling yourself it's going to take time. Because Jesus said to do it today because you're not promised tomorrow. Now do you understand? Mm -mm -mm. The same thing the fallen angels introduced all these things to mankind. One of the biggest things they gave mankind was knowledge. Consuming their minds, giving them a thousand different ways, a no good way. And people still say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll change tomorrow. And we know full well, tomorrow's not going to come for some folks. And they deceive themselves. But now the church is doing it. It's no longer an emergency, which means it's no longer a priority. It's easy to tell a priority in our lives because that's what we're trying to do all day. The priority. It's so easy to tell what the priorities are. So, but I'm wondering. Who in the world is looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ saying, oh, no, not today. No, not today. Sin, you will not be a part of my life. Not today. I mean, if you're going to be crazy, you might as well talk to yourself and start stepping away from sin and say, don't you ever return. You might as well wake up every day and say the same thing and walk out of it and stop compensating for it. You know how many people I know that were with Christ and said, well, I'm going to try to get this right. And wham, they were dead. Do you know how many people I know? I know hundreds of people like that. Personally, I knew them. Oh, I'm going to try to get it right. Some were abusive to their wives. Some were just mean. Some were, they, they couldn't make the choice yet. They had excuses, all of them. Wham, they got taken without notice. They never made it to the next hour. Where do you think their lives are? They didn't fully, I'm telling you right now, they did not fully surrender to Christ. Nor did they execute those things that Christ said to execute. He said, those who belong to him hear his voice if you hear his voice how can you not execute what he says because if you hear him and don't do your disobedience and you're a child of the prince of the air you see the our priorities are all messed up case in point is this many people think they have tomorrow jesus said we do not the fallen angels well they taught something else see man will teach man that a book is supposed to be or not supposed to be what has the holy spirit revealed see if you ask a person well who told you anything was real or fake? See, you guys see how that works? Man teaches man. Man accepts man's words as truth. Man continues man's work in the earth, confusing everybody else, and nobody has the truth. But we have the Holy Spirit that pierces all the lies right to the truth. Man taught man these things. All the discoveries in earth were imparted to you by man. And the Lord said, trust the Lord thy God only. 
And I'm telling you now, unless I've seen it with my own eyes, I'm the most, I'm telling you, I'm one of those skeptical folks with any book. It is the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Holy Spirit, there's no contradiction in the words of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is consistent, saying the same thing all the time. The Holy Spirit is always right, and our minds and hearts are always messed up and wrong. There are a lot of people who are trying to find the truth. I'm telling you now, I found it. And it is Jesus of Nazareth. It begins with him. It also begins with a 100% surrender of self. Once you do a 100% surrender of self, well then, because everything the Holy Spirit calls a person to do is going to be unfavorable to man. Don't you know this? Carefew says, sometimes I have a real inner conflict between doing the things today or waiting for the Lord. How do I tell the difference? Here it is. You guys ready for this? If the Lord has imparted something to you and you know how to do something, that's what you're responsible for. You're responsible to carry out whatever the Lord gives you this day. And don't you know, whatever he gives you today is going to stick around with t tomorrow, right? So then, you're responsible for that. You are not responsible for doing anything he is not giving you to do. I know of many things, but the Lord did not give me to do those things. I know of many things. I could talk about many subjects, but the Lord has not laid it upon my heart to do it. Whatever he lays upon your heart, you're anointed to do without failure. Whatever he has not laid upon your heart, you know of it, but you better not go and do it. You better wait for him. And if he does, if he does not give you the go-ahead, just simply don't do it. But if he has given you the go-ahead, you better execute it. Learn to work via the Holy Spirit. Not your feelings, not your brains, but the Holy Spirit. You ever go down the road and something hits your mind and says, don't go, don't go straight, turn left. And you don't turn left and then something has happened. You ever have that? You ever have one of those things where you're, you're trying to read the Bible? Somebody rings the phone and you already know who it is. Now, you can't tell who it is by how the phone rings. How did you know who it was? Holy Spirit. So what I'm saying is this, that it is the Holy Spirit, which is the God of our life that never lies. Not man's teachings. And you guys all the time, you'll hear me say, I, I, I'll say many things against man. Because listen, mankind is not holy. The Father is holy. And what he sends is holy. His words are holy. If his words are holy, which they are, then Jesus is holy. And the guidance of how to use that word via the Holy Spirit is holy. But man's stuff is corrupted. You know, the word says, when you walk after the flesh, you reap corruption of the flesh and everything else that goes with the flesh. The flesh, you'll reap corruption. You sow into the flesh, invest in your flesh, you're going to reap corruption. That's the only thing you reap in the flesh is corruption. Now, because that statement is true, this is what happened with the fallen angels. Why? Because their teachings were to honor things unto the flesh. See, God is the author and finisher of our faith. But who's the author of the folks' faith who are outside the kingdom of God? Who's first? Follow me on this. The fallen angels caught, taught mankind all sorts of things. He taught them how to, the fallen angels who were on earth, taught men how to abort babies, taught men medical practices, taught men uh, the, the, the practice of pharmaceuticals and things that, I mean, some dangers. Do you know they were doing cocaine in Egypt? You guys know that, right? Because most of the mummies they found, cocaine was in the bones of the, the uh, mummified body. And that's not what they embalmed them with. In fact, a lot of people who died in Egypt were doing cocaine. These guys were high all the way. They were doing everything by cocaine. Guess why they did that, though? And guess why they did mushrooms and everything else? This is part of knowing their culture. They did this to get in contact with another realm. But the kings of Pharaoh, oh, they lied to you big time. The kings of Pharaoh do not have a DNA match. They, they have something different going on. In other words, they have the genes that most people have, but they have extra genes nobody has ever seen before. It's probably why they mummify themselves. So Lucifer could prove to the current followers of Lucifer, yes, I'm real. And you have the Illuminati, who serves what? The Shining Ones. The Illuminati is a real group. They're over. They're very real, just like the Masons. But there's a different thing with the Illuminati. Okay, there's the see the Jesuits. Listen, the, do you know that the Jesuits are at war with the Illuminati? But the Jesuits are losing. Why? Because the Illuminati are based in the supernatural forces. Supernatural forces they are. You know the Bilderberg meetings. Those people who sit underneath the Illuminati and try to do things are the Jesuits. But the Illuminati. They have the way. Why? Because they hold, that's why they hold the resources. Did you also not know that everybody who's ever been in politics is of the lineage of royalty, period? Most of them come from England. Did you know that most of the actors and actresses in Hollywood also 
have a lineage of kings and queens. Do you all know that? Did you all know that most of the actors that you like in movies, they're either a lineage of France or England or something like that, they are. Which means there has never been an outside president because they're all devoted to, see, here's how they work. They will devote their own children that don't know any better to the cause of something else. And for the sake of their bloodline, guess what? They'll do what they have to do. If that means they have to sacrifice their son, then so be it, they'll do it. They'll have their son killed. If somebody has to die, then they have to die. Now, we see those things as tragedies. Oh, they shot one of the heads of state. They see it as a necessary sacrifice. See, they, don't, they know people don't die. And everybody cannot make it in this world. And I'm telling you that in order for you to make it in the world, you have to be approved by those who govern the world. Yes, they govern the world. They're heads of corporations. They control the banks, money, and all that good stuff. You've heard about all that stuff, but they're the controllers. And you don't go against them either. Because, in fact, you know what people do most of the time? They hold their heads low and keep going on in life. This same stuff happened with fallen angels, which is why society was corrupted. But what happened was mankind could no longer sustain the activities of them. Now, the fallen angels who first did this introduced these things into the world as it is they are bound. They're bound. What they did teach mankind is strange indeed, but people still worship the same things. Do you know that half the logos that you see are very well designed? Your money, very well designed. You look it over and it means everything. You fight over money that says in God we trust. The face on there identifying the shining one, they are edifying. If it says in God we trust, why not have the cross on there or something like that? No, that's not what they're going to do. They're going to put a person's face up there. And guess what they call them? Guess what they call a president? The secret societies call a president who has fallen like that. They call them a shining one. You don't believe me? Go look at their statues. Go look at their depictions. Go look at the mirrors and the walls and everything else. They portray them as people who intercede for the kingdoms of earth being in heaven. That's what they do. George Washington being the first. He is the new deity. That's why he's sitting in that statue with a staff. What's he doing with a staff? He's sitting in a king's chair and people don't even know it. James says, Mike, have they been uh, restructuring our DNA and how? I think they've been killing our immune systems, number one. It's causing people to be mentally weak, number two. And as people are doing this, you have another set of people who are well adapted to all the poisons and everything else it will not touch. See, this is funny. The human body is so resilient that if the human body was existing in a time of poisons and things like that, it would certainly adapt over a few generations to the poisons, making the children immune to the poisons. But you wouldn't be. But they're attacking us mentally, slow us down, to keep us kind of kind of solve it to their situation. Why do you think people are so quick to just look away from all the disaster? See, it's easy for a person to do this. When you see something on the news and it begins to overwhelm you, you will never go and, and spiritually enter into that fight. You'll just turn the TV off, wipe your brain of it, turn on some music, forget that it's ever happening, and that becomes your world. So in other words, you are tuning everything out, and you're not fighting anything. You're not fighting the good fight of faith for things that you see. But the point is you saw it, and you didn't even pray for it, because you think your prayers won't count wrong, and this is how they want you to be. So they've been attacking your faith from the beginning, and everything else. All the fallen had to do was teach mankind. And they, they, people began to worship mankind. But this is where all the different type gods came from during the time of the fallen. Very important to remember. And they started building these massive cities in the earth. And there were some before that too, yes. And then they just began to sin against everything. Everything was out of control. And then mankind, even after when Noah, re, when his, his children repopulated the earth. And it speaks about uh, these, 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 like a lot of people. They read the book of Cain. They read the Genesis. They see Noah as being saved. And, and all of men that died, right? They see him dying. But then they still say the seed of Cain is still on the earth. But I thought everybody died. See, these things must be tackled. No longer left as questions. You see that? But they're just destroying people. That is true, Angela. Although our flesh is weak, our spirits are willing. But what they're doing is attacking the spirit through faith. See, when a person has a lack of faith, that has nothing to do with the flesh that all that has to do with the spirit. The spirit will either grow or die based upon what enters into our brains. And believe me, many things have entered into our brains already. In fact, for every truth in the word of God, there is a fallacy in the world that teaches against it. It tells you you don't have to live that way. 
You don't have to live under the bondage of believing in faith. You can live in the freedom of this kingdom. This is what they're teaching people. And people exercise that right all the time. Now, I can tell you this now. You know how a lot of people say, well, they can't take our rights away. Nobody can take my rights away because they were given by the Father, not by man. Now, if they have a problem with that, they can take it up with the Father because he will intervene. He has and he will continue to do so. How about that? That's just like uh, a lot of people get worried when the communications and COT are falling off and, and based on things. That, listen, if the Father wants me, if he has appointed me to get something out, it's going to be put out. You can have all the interruptions you want. It's going to be put out anyway because anything he calls somebody to do, he's paved the way for it to be done. And when he calls you to do something, you're going to have to press through to do it. Just like when he sent the disciples out two by two, your walk is no different. He said, don't take anything with you. And if you enter into a house and they don't receive what you're saying, shake the dust off of your feet and go to another city. Why did he say that? Why did he say not take anything with you? Because he didn't want them to worry about provisions. He didn't want them to contemplate what they're going to wear and all this crazy stuff that we contemplate now. He wanted them to go and depart the gospel of Jesus Christ because he was telling us something in a like manner. That's why he also said, if you don't hate mother, father, brother, sister, or anybody else, you cannot be his disciple. He also told his disciples, go out there, don't take anything with you. Everything is going to be provided to you on the way. Why? Because they lived the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the disciples are an example of how to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple does. A disciple does not end up rich because they will disassociate themselves from those who cannot be reached. The meek and the humble who are the poorest of the poor will never go to any mega churches because they have nothing to wear. They don't smell too good. They live in poor environments, but their hearts are beautiful. People treat them as trash because their skin may look dirty. They may, may look repulsive, but inside they're shining so brightly. And the ones who look good on the outside stink on the inside. They smell, they stink. They think they're holy by what they buy because they're able to buy. That doesn't make a person holy. The fallen angels came and twisted all of this. One good way to see if you operate in the flesh is to see if you're repulsed by smells. Because if you operate by love, let me, let me tell you something. Have you ever smelled, have any of you ever smelled the insides of a person? I mean, it's bad, right? Can I tell you something? Now, if, if, if you just smelt it off the way, it could make you just up chuck, right? It really could. But when you love someone, you don't care what it smells like. You don't care if it gets on you. You don't care. Just like when you love that little bitty baby and he throws up all over you. That throw up stinks. You don't care because you love that little baby. But if you're one of those, if you're another kid that doesn't really care about that baby and it throws up on you, you might throw up yourself because that throw up smell made you sick. You're focused on the throw up and not the baby. As a parent, you're focused on the baby and not the throw up. Yeah, they messed your shirt up, big deal. You go clean up the baby, you still got stuff all over your shirt. You don't care. Why? Because you love the baby. And when you love your brother and your sister, nothing of them will repulse you. See, that's the true test. But Christians are repulsed. Well, don't get near me, you, you know this. Now, true enough, I don't like to be touched. I don't like to be touched because I guess you could say I'm a very, uh, uh, let's just say I know where people's hands have been. I don't like to be touched by folks who are just rotten. And you have that discernment to know if a person's rotten. And you don't want them, you wouldn't want them to touch you either. But I'll tell you this, if I were in around a bunch of bums, I could sit with the bums and embrace them because they're bums. I could go where any of the homeless are no matter how bad they smell and embrace them because they're poor and homeless. I cannot be around those who are billionaires and they are the true stinky ones. You see, the ones that smell the best who are the, the, the cleanest, they stink the most. The ones who are the dirtiest and who are repulsive, they're the precious ones. See, it's all backwards for me. It's been that way since I was a child. Sorry about that. It's just the way it is. Because with discernment, you see the inside, not the outside. No wonder Jesus said, the Pharisees, as Pharisees, it says, you... You know, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is full of dead men's bones. What does that mean? Well, if the inside of the cup is full of dead men's bones and it's dirty and all this stuff, then through the oppression of others, that's how they stay clean. They stay clean through the oppression of others by putting themselves above everybody else. This was also taught by the fallen angels, a control mechanism. This is what is in the world today. Let me tell you how much of a privilege it is to speak to you guys. It's such an important thing to speak to anybody else concerning anything holy that you find yourself saying lord you got to help me talk to your people because you begin to look at god's people as though they are just the, the best
rest, they are just the most beautiful people you ever met. And you have to give them something pure. I know I'm not alone in that when you see God's people that way. Even the ones that, well, you know, they're, they're disagreements and people don't hear everything you say. And sometimes I get some rotten emails and stuff, but they're still important to me. Isn't that funny? All right, they can shoot me out an email, but I'll still pray, Lord, prepare me. Because I have to speak to that person. Sometimes I'm writing emails to a person who has just, you know, thrown me well up under the earth. I will pray because there, I feel that importance. I also feel hopeful. I never feel hopeless writing somebody back. I always feel hopeful. And then I hear what they're saying. Then I say, Lord, show me what I can do different next time. Not to call the, cause this offense. Because you see, you know, I found something else out in life that's very important. You guys ready for this? When we want so many people to change and we wish they would change, sometimes you have to change yourself. You'll never change anybody else. But you can always come up another notch in your standards. And when you do that, many things are avoided. Because didn't the Lord say he would give us words that they wouldn't be able to gain say against? He is the one that will stop the insults of others and everything else. Of course they're going to revile you and talk about you and things. That's not what I'm talking about. You know when you get an email of somebody cursing, they didn't hear a word you said, but you know when somebody heard the words you said, and they just, then they throw you under the bus for what you said. I'm talking about those people. You know, the ones who hurt the most. It didn't hurt me at all when somebody didn't even hear what I said. And they throw me under the bus. They're supposed to do that. They're supposed to hear me talking and don't like my voice and tune me out. They're supposed to say stuff like that. <clears throat> but that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ones who hear what you say and then throw you under the bus. You know, the ones that count. The ones who really are used to get at you. Yeah, I still have a smile on my face when I'm talking to them. Because I can always do something better. And the real change comes from within me, not them. You see, I know this. If I'm fully committed to the Father, then a full commitment of His Word will come through me to those people. Isn't that something? So the first person that needs to always change is me, not you. I can't change you, but I can come up another notch in my standards always. And I'll do so till the day I'm no longer on this earth, because you're worth it all. You're worth it all because the Father called you. Listen, the Lord called you. Jesus called you. Do you not know how important you are? Jesus called you. And if he called you, you deserve everything of me. And you don't owe me a thing, but I owe you it all because Jesus called you. Can you imagine that? I just want to share that with you guys. Because sometimes you don't realize how much of an awesome calling it is that you recognize the Lord. I can see you as nothing less than precious, important, the reason for it all. Because you recognize the Lord Jesus and you share in his spirit already. All you have to do is make that final commitment today. Change things today. No longer say you're going to do something tomorrow. Whatever you are able to do today, do it today. Not tomorrow. Understand that tomorrow's promise to no person. All the changes you have to do are today. And because you've been precious, you're, and you're always precious. And I'm always hopeful. And the Lord has you. Not me, not anybody else. The Lord does. He wants you to know exactly who he is. And you can. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemy. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.